It's working now. Hey, Brian. Welcome, Sarah. Hey, Zach. How's it going? You look like Papa. <laughs> Do I? Well, you tell me. Hey, look at Brian. that. <laughs> there's a there's a Saskatchewan Here's young. Say hello. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Art? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can. Uh, okay. We good? Right. We're good. You want to get started? There? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. You sound great. Are you recording? Or are we live? We're recording. Okay. Yeah. Um, hold on one sec. All right, here we go. Just got a short intro for you. Okay. Welcome to My Dad Used to Play Hockey, episode number 10. My name is Zach Kinderchuk. Uh, I am your host and talking to uh, one of the enemies today. Um, he is a <laughs> six time as a player champion. Uh, well, had to get another one as a coach to make it a, a lucky seven. He's a Stanley Cup hog. Um, if you're an Islanders fan, you might know him as Brian Trottier. If you saw him in the spectrum, you probably know him better as Boo. Boo Trottier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome, Brian Trottier. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Hey, Zach. Thanks for the invite. Awesome. Awesome hey, to be here. Thanks for coming on. And I, I was reading up on you, and you used to play for Swift Current, the Broncos, and it, Everyone that watches this from Canada, I guess I have to call it Speedy Creek. So Swift Current, Speedy Creek. And, you know, you're a, a promising young player, but we're afflicted, according to the internet, Brian. So I'm going to, you know, obviously going to make sure that there's there's validity to this. You were uh, afflicted with some severe homesickness. And of all people, the league leader of all time, NHL all time leader in penalty minutes, Dave Tiger Williams, um, was a close friend and talked you into staying. We're going right to the source. Is this true? Talked me into it. He came and got me. I was I wasn't going back. I was homesick and I was getting beat up all the time. I was only as small as five six hundred sixty five pounds, but when you're playing against monsters like two hundred pound monsters, beards and everything, I, I was intimidated. But you know they were just ragdoll me and I was bruised, lost my front teeth, and I was just so homesick. Anyways, Christmas time and. Um, I wasn't going back and I just missed, I missed the game in Saskatoon on the, on boxing day, the 26th and Tiger showed up on the 27th, he drive, drove through a blizzard and uh, came down. He said, uh, I'm, I'm here to pick you up. I said, I don't think I'm going back. And mom fixed him breakfast and uh, dad looked up and he said, you know, you can always come home. And uh, that's where words I think I needed to hear. Next thing you know, I'm in the car with Tiger heading back to Swift Current in the blizzard. And, uh, you know, he said, I'm going to play left wing with you. No one's going to touch you. Just uh, your ho and hockey was fun again. And anytime somebody even looked at me, he'd beat the crap out of them. And, you know, I like to bump guys, but, I, you know, I, I wasn't trying to get Tiger in trouble. But, you know, like he, he grappled with me every day. He kind of taught me how to protect myself. And he was the only guy who was allowed to touch me. You know, he'd maul me every practice. And, you know, he's basically trying to like teach me how to like, like, like use leverage and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, he's just a great teacher and he was a great friend. You talk about a mentor, like you, you need a big brother at the right time. And he was there. He dragged me back to Swift Current and uh, he tells me years later, I didn't know it at the time, but he said, Stan Dunn, our coach said, you don't bring that kid back. Tell Buzz you're, Brian's old man that he's got a new hired hand because don't come back without that kid. I didn't know it at the time and Stan never said anything. So dad would have had a new hired hand if I was coming back, but I, I think he would have dragged me into the car, hog tied me. Like, I, I, I don't know. Ty, I know Tiger pretty well. He's tough as nails. And yeah. he would have, he would have had a wildcat on his hands. I, I was pretty adamant at the time, but dad just had the right words. I think, you know, you can always come home. And, and I think every kid who's homesick should hear that because I think knowing that you can always come home, give it a second chance, a third chance, you know, like, and, and eventually, you know, you just kind of like, but I think all those things, Stan Dunn was good to me, he always put me in situations. I think that he realized, you know, like you're young, you're only like 16 years old and a little bit homesick, but I think, you know, like he knew something I didn't know or something, he saw something I didn't see, but I was just like, okay, I'll give this one more whack. And it was just fun again for whatever yeah. reason. And, and, um, you know, good things happened. You know, I finished the season that pretty strong. I played a little bit more than I was first half of the season. And, you know, second year was just fantastic because 
you know, I just moved up the ladder, you know, guys were, guys were moving on or, you know, injury or whatever. And I kind of lifted into the second line role. And next thing you know, I'm playing power play. Next thing you know, okay, pucks are going in. I'm like, Oh, holy cow, this is kind of fun. You know, like in, you know, Tiger, people don't give him enough credit. He, he, he's, he's a skilled player. Like he, he scored a lot of goals in junior mm -hmm. and he was fun to play with. Like he give and go hockey was his style. And, you know, he knew the short, the short uh, pick plays and, you know, the give and goes and, I learned a lot playing with him and with Terry Ruskowski, a good Prince Albert boy, like he was our captain. And that was our power play was, was Ruskowski, Trotsky and, and Williams up front. And then we had some guys on the point, but just blast the puck. And we just like make fun things happen down low. And I think Tiger, he went back on the point a few times, but he, like, he's a skilled guy. And when, when you're on a mission to get to the NHL, like Tiger was and did all the other things that he had to do, like, then I'm just the kind of little puppy dog following her behind him. Right. Okay, I and I, I was the beneficiary of all that fun stuff. So like he was just a good big brother I needed at the right time. Do you think that if he had not come come in and got you, were you done hockey for good? Or was was this just I need some time away? Maybe I need to bulk up, whatever it is. Yeah. Or do you yeah. think that would have been the end of your career? Zach, great question. Like like I, I figured I'd finish up that year at home and play maybe a little senior hockey with the team locally, because I'd played the year before with the senior team and then you know, maybe, I don't know, just finish high school, maybe try out for the Huskies, like the, the, the university team, Saskatoon, maybe. And then, you know, just try the university route. I wasn't going to give up on hockey completely. Hockey was, I was just playing in a league that was just not, it was just out of my reach. Like I was just reaching a little out of my, out of my comfort zone and being small. And that league was tough. I mean, holy cow. Mm. If you looked at somebody sideways, they just figured you wanted to fight. And, you know, like, I was like, I didn't want to eyeball anybody. <laughs> and it was just comical, you know, how, how it was in those days and how intimidating it was. And, you know, but you gauged yourself, you know, like, and, you know, like you just gauge yourself against some of the, some of the talents in the league. Say, oh, I can, I can skate with him. I, oh, he's bigger than me. I, I'm a little quicker than him. Or I'm oh, a little more skilled than that guy. And you kind of keep gauging yourself. And, you know, I like, you know, Dennis Sobchuk and, you know, Tom Lysak was probably two of the best centermen in the league at the time when I was there. And, Chipper Field was scoring like incredible amount of goals. And there were some really good skilled center icemen. And I, you believe it or not, I, I came into junior hockey as a defenseman. And I was just, you know, because I could play, I could log minutes. And, you know, when you only have a few kids in a little town of Almerie, you get a lot of minutes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, playing, you know, 30, 40 minutes a game was fun for me. But, you know, like going to, to play junior hockey, I wasn't big enough to be a defenseman. And so I had to play a little forward. And I like playing forward too. Um, but it was just, it was just a different, different kind of game and I said I, I learned how to play this forward game because if I'm going to play junior hockey for a year or two I figured I'd give it my best shot and but no I wasn't quite done hockey but I was thinking I just have to take a different path for a while right. did those feelings come so you break into the NHL with the Islanders in the 75-76 season did did some of those feelings come with you did it you know where you're sizing you're up sizing yourself up against all the other players, you know, you're, you're trying to keep your head down and not eyeball anybody. Or at that point, were you confident enough in knowing, all right, you know, I'm not a Tiger Williams type player, but I'm a Brian Trotte type player. And, and that has value. Cause you know, the first year, I think you logged 92 points. I mean, you came in and were impactful immediately. Well, I think you carry a certain amount of confidence, but like getting drafted and then, going back and play another year junior after that, and then being a captain, getting a leadership role, working with Earl Langerfield as my coach in Lethbridge. I think uh, uh, recognizing that you are one of the more um, capable offensive players in that Western Hockey League, because I ended up like pushing like almost to the end, almost won that scoring championship against Mel Bridgman. But, you know, we, our little, our little Lethbridge team, we competed hard and I, you know, Earl was awesome. Again, like you, you need ice time. You need to play with the right players. You need to like be, be successful, get the you know, power play, those kinds of things. And then going to world juniors, that first world juniors in Winnipeg, again, gauging yourself some more, going to training camp the following year, and then having an opportunity to see how the pros train and how the, how fast they are and how strong they are and how quick they are and how they make decisions just a little bit quicker. And, and, and again, you've got to be a quick learner. You've got to be a good student and you're grabbing as much as you possibly can and kind of absorbing and listening and, and you're just eager and you want it, you want it, you want to belong. And then again, Al Arbor just throwing me with the right guys. And, you know, like I'm saying, well, I better appreciate this because I, this doesn't always happen and recognizing that, Hey, it's good fortune. 
you know, take advantage of it. At the same time, don't stop appreciating. And, and you know, hockey players, we're always spreading the wealth anyway. And, and there is a tremendous amount of appreciation with the guys you're playing with. So like Clark Gillies, who's my new Tiger Williams, don't touch Strache. <laughs> Billy Harris, you know, who's like a really good finisher. Like he had great hands, good, good playmaker. And then we were playing power play at Dennis Pop at the point. So good things again are happening in the island. And all of a sudden I'm in a role where I'm an opportunity to excel. And you you don't stop appreciating and you never stop learning and you never saw like, and that's just the hunger factor. And I think all of us have that. And I think that in order to, to get to the NHL, you need that. But I think beyond that, you gotta you gotta really have a sense of confidence and really wanna wanna strive to be the not only the best you can be but help your team become the best they can be. And uh, when you're team minded, I think all of us are, when you're very team minded, because I always, always say this about hockey, if, if you're an individualist, you'll go kind of get weeded out and the guys will know, ah, he's a little bit ugly selfish. But if you're team minded and you're, you're contributing offensively, guys love that because you're that good selfish and mm-hmm. you want to score goals. You want to like contribute offensively. And, and those things are good. But when you're team minded, I think those things really help. And like Al Arbor was good because he had a team system. And as long as you were like, like mindful about playing that system, you could go outside the boundaries and be a little bit individual and make some fun things happen creatively without getting yelled at. And, <laughs> but if you didn't mind, or you weren't mindful of the defensive zone and the four check and positioning and body position, he was in your face. And, and I, we all, uh, respect that that's a, that's what coaching is basically is just being accountable for all those things and when you're self-accountable then he can concentrate on the team and doesn't have to beat on you as an individual so no al was great for us really fair coach but i think you know i think when you when as you're climbing that ladder through junior hockey into the nhl you want to be hungry and you want to be a student and you want to be grasping as much as you can and learning engaging and and taking as much of that experience you have in junior hockey relating that to the next level because you never stop learning like you every year is a new year every game seems like it's a new game and uh you know the, the competition is is always high and that brings out the best of both teams so you gotta you gotta be ready i mean man it was it was just a it, it's just a whirlwind of fun that's the way, only way to explain it so you mentioned being a student and you, uh, you know, you come in kind of towards the end of the, the bullies, the Broad Street bullies, my dad's team, uh, their dynasty. They made it to the cup finals the first year you were in the league after winning the previous two years. But uh, at that point, they were, they were beat up. The Canadians had a, an amazing, amazing squad. The, the, you know, the bullies are often credited with kind of changing at least um, the, the way fans appreciated the game, if not the way that it was actually played on the ice. As a student, you know, having be, having had to watch the bullies before playing against them, um, what did you learn from that team? Well, you learn respect. That's the first thing you learn. You know, the Ed Van Imp's got a really heavy stick, and you know that uh, <laughs> Moose Dupont's going to take you out pretty hard. <laughs> Every faceoff's going to be a battle. I mean, Bobby Clark, I mean, your dad, you go into Philly, it's, it's a battle. And it's a great battle. And I, and I think those of us that enjoy that battle and the competition really thrive on it. So our Islander team, and this is my first game exhibition game in Philadelphia. It was uh, you know, it's a quick, very quick story, but you know, our locker room is tough. We got Gillies, we got Howard, we got Nystrom, we've got Dave Forche, Dave Lewis, Bob Bourne. And these guys are young, eager guys, and they're ready to drop the gloves with anybody. And we're going to the broad street bullies and our team is like, they're like, I want, I want hammer. I want moose. I want, I want the big bird <laughs> right. and, I, and it's getting closer to me. And I'm like, Oh, who do I say? And I'm, I'm thinking it gets to me and they're all looking at me. The whole room's looking at me. Nobody says anything. And I'm like, McLeish, they go, Oh, good choice. And they keeps going around the room. So the game starts and there's Rick McLeish and I were, were paired up. And uh, I said, we got to go. He goes, what? I said, yeah, I guess we got to go. And I'm, ready to smoke him and he hits me with three lefts bang 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 and i'm like joel's we get enough i said yeah we're good and the, the guys all pat me on the shoulder afterwards say good job kid i was like i just got freaking three quick left <laughs> i didn't even get a punch in but, it, but that was that was the game and the and and so like but the raw street bullies you like you learn respect you learn how to battle you learn that every game is going to be a 60 minute game you know, you take nothing for granted because if you're up by one, they'll come right back and, you know, find a way they don't quit. 
And, uh, you know, that was from Bobby Clark on through that team. And that was kind of their MO. And it was, it was pack mentality. You know, you hit one, you hit, you're hit. you going to pay the price somewhere down the road. You mm-hmm. learn a lot of things about playing against the bullies that um, I think all everybody, every team got. Because, like, when you have a team that's back, got each other's back, I mean, that's a team that cares. And, and you're going to, you know that. You're looking around and say, hey, good, I'm not, I'm not alone in this battle. And that's our Islander team. We, we, you steal something from everybody. And we watched how Montreal practiced. We watched how, how Philadelphia you know, played every game. We watched how the Bruins were. Some of the best teams in the league we, taught us something. And you, and you watch how they practice. You watch how they, the, 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 they're professionals and how they conduct themselves in those situations, whether it's on the ice or off the ice. And you see these guys off the ice. The first time I met Phil Esposito, I was like, what a gentleman. Like, like he, himself, <laughs> and he's a, he's a complete jerk on the ice. And I, I tell him that, you know, like, I'm like, Phil, you're, you're a really ugly player. He goes, Hey, just trying to make a little space for myself, you know, <laughs> and, and Bobby Clark, same thing, you know, just quiet and unassuming, polite. And on the ice, he's like this terror. And I'm like, Oh, okay. I get it. So there's, there's just that, that respect hmm. um, factor that everybody knows that, you know, Hey, you got to be professional on the ice and off the ice. But hey, we're all just human beings and we all care about the game. We all care about, you know, each other. We're not out there to like, well, I thought some of those guys were out to maim me, but I don't know. Well, they were. <laughs> but I think all of us, <laughs> all of us have that genuine respect, I think, for the game and, and, and making sure that we're playing, you know, as hard as we can, you know, as physical as we can and still not, you know, we're not headhunting. So some of the guys were, but not me. I was like, I only, I only hit the guys that hit me. I said, you know what? I don't think I hit Guy Lafleur or. Mario Lemieux or Wayne Gra- bumped them a little bit. They never like, but if somebody hit me, I'm like, okay, like we're playing that game. Tiger <laughs> taught me how to play this game. <laughs> it's all good, Zach. There, there was that you were the dynasty, you know, the amazing Islanders dynasty that you were a part of, that you spearheaded, uh, came during such a, a, a tremendous amount of change in the league and the game. You know, you had the massive um, merger between the WHA and the NHL. Uh, you know, the introduction of uh, arguably the greatest player of all time with Wayne Gretzky and, and with all hockey pants that went down to your ankles for a little while. I mean, those lasted. Um, but through all this, all of this change, the one thing it seemed like you can count in, count on year in and year out for a while was, well, the Islanders are going to be there in the finals and the Islanders are going to win the cup. I get, I get how that you build momentum to win the first and then win the second but that that those third and fourth years, that's when things like that's when teams get talked about forever and ever. How do you keep guys who have already tasted such huge amounts of success from being from remaining as hungry, you know, in year three and even more so in year four? Well, I think it's uh, it, it falls on leadership on the, by the players. But we were young and dumb. I think it really helps. And you know, when you're a young team and you you can you, you rebound quick quicker you know we weren't 30 year old veterans we were a young team and you know we're 23 24 25 26 years old winning cups that's kind of in the prime of your life of, of your of your career basically so we were able to stay healthy we had a we had an orthopedic doctor who got us into strength training and injury prevention and uh just exercises stretching that kind of like helped us recover also helped us you know work on our aerobic and we were one of the one of the early teams that worked on that kind of stuff, and um, our trainer was, you know, a master at like motivating. Al was really good, kind of a, you know, hey, get on that bike, hey, get mm-hmm. the other way, like you know. And so you need you need everybody kind of like doing all those things, and um, you know, and then you know, obviously myself or Dennis and Mike and Clark, and you know, the leadership of the the core really has to like be mindful and setting the example, so everybody follows. And our our we call them soldiers, but like you know those guys that don't get a lot of headlines or the third, fourth line guys, they are dynamic and they, they are intense. And that intensity where the Tonelli or Howard or whoever, that intensity is, it, 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 it kind of flows through the locker room and you're pulled into that intensity because we're all, we all have that drive, but, but that good inner intensity of a team is important. So as we kind of won, our confidence blossomed, then everybody's out for you. They're playing their best goalie. They're yeah. playing their best game every night. So we got to lift our game on a bit. So our, our basic, our, our gauge all the time, like through regular season was here. And we still had to find another level come playoff time. We never wanted to blow anybody out. That was never our intention. We want to play as better than everybody, every game. And 
come playoff time, find that level that we had to have, especially the first early two rounds when everybody's fresh. Um, and as you go through the playoffs, obviously, you know, you get a little more tired, beat up or whatever, and you're still intense and you've got to find another level to beat the other team. But everybody, you know, you're just like, you got, now you have to like attrition. It's a war of attrition. Who, mm-hmm. Who's going to, who's going to wear out first. And uh, so we we learned that and it's like, okay, we don't have to blow it all every game. We just got to play well enough. And we need everybody because you need, you, you can't, you can't beat up your, your, your top two lines to get to the playoffs and they got nothing left. And that's where we became a four line team where we depended on four lines, not only to, to play well, but to contribute offensively and the power play to be effective and stay hot going through the playoffs. Special teams are so important as you know, Zach, like it's just, if you have the hot goalie, hot, hot uh, uh, penalty kill, hot power play, um, and your team is confidence is high. I tell you, you got to ride that wave, and you got to. And if it's not there, you got to turn it around as fast as you can because I tell you, it'll bite you in the butt. And uh, so that's that's what we learned through those first years of winning. Well, even losing, we learned. That, you know, we we're blowing our wad here early. We got we got we got to find a way to hit that playoff on a on a on a high. But there's chemistry involved. You got the right group of guys that all kind of pull together, gel together. You know, Goring came. Um, Moro came from the from the uh, Olympics. Uh, Sutter came from junior, and all of a sudden, you know, there was a there was like a, this nucleus of and chemistry that kind of hit the team right at the right time. Billy Smith got red hot, and you know we rode that, and it was all, power play was on fire, and um, so we know all those things. And Al was always you know pl- reminding us all the time. And when you when you, you learn all those things, you apply them come year three, year four, and it almost got us fifth up till those creepy Oilers came along. But like when you when you're riding those things and learning and 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 basically executing, you know, good things are going to happen. Yeah, it's just that the you know you mentioned you got to ramp it up because for four straight you, there's there's one thing about being the up and coming team, but then there's the team you know everybody just not only wants to beat on the scoreboard but just wants to beat down physically, so to to maintain all that um, and 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 to have to play a longer season than inevitably anybody else does for four straight years, uh, yeah. You know, you, you kept mentioning players that were added to your team's nucleus. And, you know, even a casual hockey fan can go break down the roster and recognize every player on the Islanders. Like it is it, during that that four cup run. It was pretty extraordinary how much, you know, everyone contributed. Yeah, there was 14 or 16 guys, I think, that were on that team on all four cups. And uh, that fifth cup, we got LaFontaine, Flatley, Deneen. I'm trying to remember who else was new on the team that year. And although they were young and, and, and really eager to contribute, you know, it really changed the chemistry of the team uh, going into that, into that drive for five. And we got all the way to the finals. But like you said, you're, you're, you're beat up. You find ways, you know, people think you're long in the tooth. Well, you're just you're playing a lot of extra games, you know, 20 extra games a year, you know, mm-hmm. basically, and they're, they're hard games and you have a shorter span. So we're finishing up like the end of May and now we're starting again in September. Sometimes we had Canada cups. We're starting in August. So like, and it's just, it's just extra games on the body. And uh, so no complaints at all. I mean, we just, we were young and dumb and we want to play every game we possibly could. And it was a, a just a very fun time of, our lives because man, you, you go back and I know I talked to your dad. We don't change a thing. That, that was like the best ever. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. But it has to end, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing run. And if, you know, if you had uh, the run had to end, you got uh, the the next team that came about was, was pretty good too. Yeah. No, no, they were, if you're going to lose to somebody, lose to great people and they were great. And, and, respectful i mean it's, they're just great guys and we called them the creepy oilers because like they we they were cocky and they were like you know they were they were young and they were just they just had a swagger and we're like Ugh! you know and then they, they wanted what we had and when they it's not it's very unique that two teams finish especially in you know you know a 20 30 team league where two teams finish back to back in the finals so the fact that we beat them when they beat us when the next year that's pretty unique. No six, six team league that was not mm-hmm. so unique or in the early expansion, but when you all of a sudden you're playing 30, 30 teams, Holy cow. And those same two teams meet in the finals. 
that's pretty impressive. And we teased the Oilers too, Zach, because that was the only year in the history of the, the, the game they had a 2-3-2 in the final. If they're going to have a 2-3-2, have it early in this, but not on a final, not in the final. <laughs> all, all of a sudden, we had home ice advantage. We go to Edmonton, they got home ice advantage. They wanted, they beat us once in New York. We outshot them the first game. They, they beat us one nothing, And then we beat the crap out of them in game two, 6-2 or something like that. And then, you know, they, 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 three, they, they won three in a row in Edmonton to beat us, but you know, we say, but bring us back to Long Island. They get two games in Edmonton. They got to come back to Long Island to play that one. All of a sudden, it's three-two. Now they're, you know, they're, their butt cheeks are squeezing a little tighter in Game Six. <laughs> we tease them about that, but it's not. You know, they they probably would have won anyway. We still would have liked to have it a, a two-two-one-one-one, but it's a it's a fun to be able to tease them a little bit. And then there's, I feel like after the the run ends for you is. When your career gets particularly interesting in a lot of ways. Um, so the Canada Cup, you know, it, it, it was a huge, huge deal in the 80s. Like you, the 1987 iconic, you know, Gretzky to Lemieux goal is one of the greatest goals I've ever seen. But you are a Canadian, as we mentioned. You're from Val Marie. But uh, to the chagrin of an entire nation, it seems, you decided to play for the United States team in 1984 versus Canada. Um why? Well, it was an opportunity to give back to a country where I made my living. The kids were mm-hmm. born in the States, a married American girl. And it was, the timing seemed really good. And I talked to Alan Eagleson and Team Canada and Team USA. And everybody's like, we're playing for a pension. We're playing to improve our pension plan. And, you know, you're, you're participating, you're performing, and you're there. So, so I wasn't like I, I said, I don't want to play anymore. You know, I'm tired. I, I went I, I, and all of a sudden Canada's mad at me. And I'm like, Oh my God. I, you know, like I did like, it's not as patriotic as we all are about our country. You know, I tried to explain it. I tried to say, Hey, you know, my, my, my indigenous blood, I was able to like get my, my, my uh, passport, my U S citizenship. And so that was all pretty easy. But you know, when you have the opportunity, they, they didn't want to understand that. They're like, no, no, you got to play. But right behind that, they took two checks. They took the, the Stasny's. And I get it, you know, like you want to make your team the best they can. And I wasn't trying to play against Canada. I was playing, trying to play for the Team USA right. and, and, and go to, to play some good hockey, have, have a, build our pension plan. And all of a sudden it becomes anti-Canadian. I'm like, no, I'm not an anti-Canadian. Like, you can't, you can't, you can't, as much as you can scream that, you just got to kind of, okay, take it on the chin. And then, and even now I, I try to explain it and you hope people understand, you hope people forgive you a little bit, you know, and it's, would I do it again? Maybe, maybe not, but I, you know, I did it then. That was my decision. I, you live with it. Like we all do. We live with our choices and that's, that was then. And, you know, even my kids look back and they go, what'd you do that for? I'm like, okay, well, I get it. Like, you know, like if you're, you're born a country, you play for that country. So like, I probably wouldn't do it again, but I did it and I, and I live with it now. And, I, and so even now explaining to you, it's, it's not, it's not heavy on me because it's like 40 years ago in my life. And uh, I think people do kind of forgive and forget, but um, I, I would Canada, hope so. I think it helped that Canada won that year. You know, like uh, I think they beat the Russians and then I think they played another game after that and, and won the Canada cup. So that helped a little bit kind of soften things. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine if team USA would have won? <laughs> no. I hope what, a, what an enemy I would have been then. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know after there is there is one player that i wanted to ask you uh, about playing with because you mentioned you know phil esposito complete gentleman off off the ice but a brute on the ice and then you played with mike bossy who seemed to be as delicate on the ice or as gentlemanly on the ice as he was off the ice even winning you know at least one lady bank trophy probably a, a few but when you when you look at the stats, I mean, his goals per game average is right there with the Gretzky's and Lemieux's. You know, it's just the the ultimate That's sniper. Never, I, think, I think he's number one. I think he is number one actually number in one goals, goals per game. game. Yeah, I think there's nobody even close. Like, it, there's not like there's not like a, you know a goal difference, but he's like way above everybody. So like that yeah. that to me you know puts him in a a whole different category by himself because. When you bring up Mike, like a good friend of mine, like we're still great buds. And I, I, you know, I, I, you have to look and hope both of us feel the same way. And I know probably do is we helped each other be successful to a degree. 
he would have been successful no matter what. I would probably have been a little more like maybe not as, as successful, but because of him, we were a little more successful. So it was a great tandem to be able to spend that nine, 10 years with Mike and, and have a big, be a big part of his career and some of his success. But I think for, for those who don't know Mike, he was the good selfish. He's what he's what I call a purist, like the Lemuse, the Lafleurs, the Mike Bosses. They played hockey. They they didn't go out there try to slash and whack and elbow and beat people up. I mean, they they played stick handling, passing, scoring, skating. I'll beat you. I'll beat you with as a purist, you know, hockey. Not not the intimidation factor, the cross check and that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. And and we will fight through that. And and he did. And I, I say to myself, you know, when you talk about those kinds of players, the Brett Halls that just went out there, they played hockey and they scored great goals. And they and people, oh, he's a selfish. Well, he, you know, he's a good selfish because he wanted to contribute and help. I think it helped me playing with him because I became a little more selfish because of that. I took more shots and 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 I think all of all of us recognize that Mike wanted to contribute in a good way. He wanted to, like if we won five to one, he didn't score. He was mad. Mm -hmm. he didn't help the team win and so he had to learn how to like be a more team-minded and the team had to learn how to understand that Mike was not mad that we won he was mad because he didn't wasn't able to contribute to and if we lost you know four to three he got three goals he can't be he can't be happy but so that was a kind of a like the the dynamic that that made Mike unique in that sense because he was all team and he was all about contributing but he didn't wear it well in his face if he didn't score and we won the hockey game yeah. and vice versa. If he scored a lot of goals and we won, you know, he didn't wear that well because I, res- like, I respect that. Goal goal. I think that's very honest, Brian, it, you know, t- talking to players, um, uh, you know, I just talked to Brian uh, Boucher a few episodes ago and I wanted him to admit, cause he's got the all time NHL record for uh, consecutive shutout minutes. And you always hear athletes who are on the verge of a record and they're like, you know, I don't really pay attention to my own numbers. And I'm like, please admit to me that you knew exactly how many more minutes you had to do. So I think, I think that there's something wonderful, like you mentioned about Mike Bossy, because if you're concerned about your own stats in terms of what is expected of you, which is goals and get mad when you don't perform in that stat category, that is absolutely a a team attitude. Yeah. It's honesty. And like it, it, we all do, we all are aware but we kind of like, it's not, and if it motivates you, great. Like we're aware of if there's a milestone or there's a, stati- like, like something coming up, mm-hmm. you're aware because it motivates you and you, you want to grab that. And, and the team backs you to go grab that. That's, that's really good. But if you're, you know, if you're a jerk about it, you're not going to get support from the team. You're not going to get support mm-hmm. from your teammates and, 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 and everybody knows that. That's the good thing about hockey guys. And I'm so proud of the hockey guys is we all recognize that there's a, a yin and yang in the game and we want somebody to do well. And, and we're a little part of that as, as they achieve. Mike got 50 and 50. He was the first one to say, I can't thank my teammates enough. And that meant a lot to us because yeah, we, we wanted him to get that 50 and 50. And so we all push that puck and give him extra, pa- extra passes and maybe we could have taken it, but that was fun and he did it. Uh, Billy Smith was going for a record one time. He had, he had a, um, a, a, a two and a half periods with the shutout, a full game with a shutout, and then the, another two and a half periods. And he was he was on the verge of breaking it by like a minute or two. And uh, Gordon Neen got the puck on the face off, and then and and he he tried to rifle it behind the net, and he shot it in his own net and scored on Smitty. So the record was broken. He was just a minute or two shy of that. And Smitty was drinking his beer after the game. Cause we're allowed two beer after every game. And he's sitting there <laughs> and the press are coming in and they said, Smitty, are you mad at Gordy Deneen for scoring that goal and breaking your break, have given you the opportunity to score that, uh, get that shutout record. And Smitty didn't, he sipped his beer. He goes, Nope. But I, if I knew Gordy was so accurate, the shot, it would have played a little tighter to my post. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta let it go really quick as teammates, you know, like nobody's mad, yeah. but you know, like that's just what happens sometimes in a like horrible bounce to, for Gord, but you know, we all rallied for Gordy. Nobody wanted him to like, you know, sink down into the ice and, and forever. We need you, Gordy. You got to come back rally. Mm-hmm. We're going to rally around you. Smitty was the first one to put his arm around him. All of us went, Hey, Gord, that's crap happens. Not a big deal. But, uh, you know, and that's what that's, a, that's a hysterical story. That's almost a better story than Billy Smith breaking the record. The fact that 
It, it took an Islander to score an Islander. It's hysterical. I know. <laughs> Isn't that the best? Yeah. And he's not even upset about it. Smitty's like, no, no, that's good. We're good. <laughs> so as I, as I described to you in the beginning of the show, uh, I think of you as a Stanley Cup hog because you're a part, you win four. Um, you know, 99% of players don't win any. And then, you know, you, you part ways with the Islanders and then find yourself on the Pittsburgh Penguins, the early 90s Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, you've probably heard of the two centers, you know, playing ahead of you, uh, Mario Lemieux and Ron Francis, you know, both in the top 10, I think, of scoring all time. Uh, how surreal and how surreal was it to once again realize, you know, I'm going back, I'm going back to the finals and I got a good shot of winning. And not only that, I have a really good shot of winning consecutive cups again. Well, I think, I, again, you know, when you're at the end of your career, basically, with one team. Mm -hmm. And what, here's how I felt, and, and I, I tell everybody this, and it's not a big secret, is like you're hurt. You're hurt because that team doesn't want you anymore. Right. And, and, and you're saying, you know, like, don't you appreciate the loyalty? And don't you appreciate all that? And, and it's not that. It's a business decision. You get, you, it's not personal. And as much as painful as it is, there's a whole bunch of teams that want you. So when I threw my name out there and I was talking to teams, I said, you know what? I'm a free agent. I'm going to go talk to some teams. And uh, I looked at teams that I thought were going to be on the cusp that, you know, I looked at L.A. Gretzky. I said, my God, I'd love to go maybe help him, you know, do some fun in L.A. So I called Bruce McDowell. I looked at Pittsburgh, Mario Lemieux. Paul Coffey, Tommy Barrasso, they got, they got some fun going on there. They, they, they're not, they're underachieving. I called Craig Patrick. I called Detroit. They had a young Steve Eiserman there. I said, look, my God, this would be fun to play that kid and see if I can kind of like maybe make some fun happen there in Detroit. You know, mm -hmm. Jimmy Devolano was GM. I called him. He was a former scout uh, with our, an assistant GM with our Islander team. So everybody called me back and they're all excited. And Brian, da, da, da. I wanted to be Maple Leaf. I called Toronto Maple Leafs. They, they were, they're a young team. Um, and they didn't have any veteran guys. And I thought, geez, if I go there, maybe I can give them like some veteran leadership. It might think turn. I think a, a guy, McNamara, I can't remember who called me back. And, and it was fun talking to these people because everybody's excited. And I said, Hey, first one to give a contract, you know, like they, they got, they kind of get dibs. And Ryan, I gotta say, I love, I love what you did, you know, cause obviously you're, you're an Islander. I think you still probably think of yourself primarily as an Islander, uh, but they, they decided to break up with you. So you just started calling all the hot girls in the neighborhood, <laughs> setting up new dates. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay. Oh my gosh. She's a pretty one over there. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a little bit true, but you got to let go as fast as you can. That's the professional side. And I was, I was mad. I was probably as mad as I was hurt, but I, I said, this can't define me. I, I got, I got it. I got, I think I have a little hockey left and, uh, it was really kind of nice to see that there was some interest mm -hmm. and it wasn't, you know, red hot. It was just, it was like, yeah. Oh, let, can I, I'll call you right back. And Bruce McDonald said, I'll call you right back. And I, and Jimmy, I'll call you right back. And, and Craig Patrick was, he, and Craig Patrick was the, the, the funniest actually. Cause he, he called me up. Like when I sent the, the fax to, to every team and I called his secretary, he called me back and I said, it's Brian Trotch. I sent the fax. I'm interested in come play in Pittsburgh. It was uh, Michelle Corleone and Michelle goes, well, how Brian, I'll have Craig call you right back. He called me back in like five minutes. He goes, Brian, tell me, why, why do you want to come to Pittsburgh? I said, Craig, I want to win Stanley Cup with, with, uh, with Mary Lemieux. He goes, I'll have a contract to you in 15 minutes. And he did. So, you know, that was the kind of fun that, that happened there. There was like yeah. a little, there was like a little magic. And then, and then they sent me a bunch of like, like bonuses for, for plus player and that kind of stuff. And I said, Craig, you know, I'm not going to say no to these bonuses, but I said, I want a big bonus. I want to win. It's a one-year deal. And if I win the Stanley Cup, I want a big bonus. And he goes, well, you got a bonus for winning the Stanley Cup. I said, yeah. He goes, look, you, you get a little bit every every round. You're going to make another 20 grand. I'm like, no, no, I want a big bonus. I want that big bonus. He goes, like what? I said, like, what, what does Mario have in his contract? He goes, I can't give you that. <laughs> give me half. <laughs> So when I got that bonus at the end, and you, we forget about it, you know, okay, you know, these, okay, whatever. And you forget about it. And then when June comes along and all of a sudden the bonus comes, bonus check comes in for like 250,000 bucks. I was like, oh my God, I want a bonus. You know, like I, it was really a kind of a fun, fun bonus. And, and so, and then we did it again the next year. So like, like Craig's and Craig was, we won in Minnesota. And he sits with me on the plane. He goes, you want to do it again? Cause we, when we're coming back, 
we kind of forgot about bonuses and what the contract was all about, but we're mm -hmm. so excited about winning. He sat down next to me. We're both kind of blitzed, you know, we're drinking champagne and <laughs> whatever, celebrating. We're on the plane. He said, yeah, you want to do this again? I said, yeah, let's do it again. So we signed the contract before I got my bonus thing. And so everything was exactly the same mm -hmm. and we do it again the next year. So I'm like, thank you, Mario. <laughs> so like, it's really kind of neat how the whole thing happened. But um, for me, it was, uh, I don't say vindication, but it was like a good, it, it, it made me feel good because I felt I had a little hockey left in. Mm -hmm. I went to a team that appreciated me, a city that appreciated me. I know your dad played here. I don't know if you were born when your dad played. Here. Not quite. Not quite. But Not I quite. think all of us, all of us who recognize Pittsburgh as a, you know, just a meat and potatoes, you know, blue sure. collar, you know, they appreciate every little husk. And, and I'm like, holy cow. You know, if I want to face off, Bob oh, Ryan, you're the man. <laughs> and I was like, really holy cow just a face off big deal but that's that's pittsburgh and you know so like i raised the family here and it's it become home but but there's just an appreciation factor both ways i love pittsburgh pittsburgh kind of likes me so i love that but coming to pittsburgh there was only mario and they had barry barry peterson was here i'm trying to think of some of the other center i met and that were here and i was coming to jump into that second line role and we got ronnie francis late in the year as a second line center and it added so much more to the power play because um, I was getting no power play time. There's like Mario was, wasn't playing. He had a bad back and he didn't play most of that year. And Johnny Cullen was basically our number one center Iceman. And he was playing out of his shoes and what a creative little guy he was. Mm -hmm. But I wanted that power play. I wanted, I wanted to contribute. I was getting a little frustrated. Ronnie came, the power play went up. You know, my minutes went up. And there's a whole bunch of things that happened. And I was like, holy cow, this is great. But we got, we got pretty good, pretty good center iceman here. We're, we're going to go deeper than I even thought. And all of a sudden just bang, Mario gets healthy and boom, away we go. Mm -hmm. So you can't, you can't write a script like that. Like, and I, so as, as neat as it was, like it was a little, you got to be good fortune and a little bit of luck too. That was the most fun I've ever had watching a hockey team. Those two years with Pittsburgh. Well, yeah, Yager's young, like Yager, Yager's young, and he's such a dynamic stick handler, and, and he's a fun kid, you know, big, thick Czechoslovakian accent. Goofy as all hell. And he's just a free spirit, and he just kind of speaks his mind, and people don't, don't know him, so, like, they take him the wrong way, and you know, he learned all his English from MTV, so every every <laughs> reply is a song, a, a line song. from a song, I like cherry pie. You know, like anything that had you know, Motley Crue or Warrant, he was, he'd reply in, in, in a sentence from a song and he's just a great kid. But that, that team is, you know, veteran wise, you got guys coming from misfits from everywhere. It's felt like, you know, we call like Larry Murphy, Joe mm -hmm. Mullen, myself, and, you know, Tag Linetti. I mean, you, Gordy Roberts, guys coming from everywhere to this team and it fit and it fits so well. And Joey Mullen and uh, uh, Wendell Young were, they were the, hospitality suite we had to stop in the room after every game win lose or draw that we had to make it we had to make it we had to make a uh we had to make a pit stop and everybody had to know you're there hey guys that are because that was team bonding time you know and mm -hmm. um and that's kind of fun about 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 our we find a way to bond doesn't not everybody has to do it that way but we did it every road trip boom we'd stop that hospitality suite just to giggle and laugh and you know, know just break break the ice and say hey we got to forget about this one where the win lose or draw we're on to the next game. And it was just great. That whole group of misfits, how we, how it all of a sudden gelled. And, you know, like even the guys that were here for a long time, like where there was Loney, um, Erie, you know, Bork, uh, Mario, there was, you know, the guys here that they, they appreciated us. And it was really kind of a fun time. Yeah. Then you move on the, the, the as, as what happened to everyone, you got to hang the skates up, but you were able to stay around with the game. You um, eventually you, because, you know, you have six as a player. Why not have one as a coach? Uh, as an assistant for the Colorado Avalanche, you get your seventh Stanley Cup. And then, Brian, the guest I had before you was um, a gentleman you're probably familiar with. His name is Glenn Sather. And the question I couldn't wait to get to was, you're in New York, the Rangers, and thinking about, all right, I need a new guy behind the bench. Let me get someone from the hated Islanders, <laughs> Brian Trottier. <laughs> And I know that I know it was a short run, um, but he said, this is what he said about it. I sent him a, a list of questions and I liked his answers. Do you remember those questions? 
57 questions he sent me 57 questions and um some of them were were based on hockey philosophy 20 some of those and the rest of them were based on team philosophy and uh, you know i just hand wrote all my answers and fired it back to him and and he called me up and he goes you want to come in for an interview i said well, i'd love an interview um but working with glenn was probably one of the best experiences i've ever had like he's he's honest He's forthright. He's genuine. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. He gives you every opportunity to, he doesn't give you any excuse not to win. He wants to support you. And uh, I learned that with, with Glenn and I, I can't thank him enough for that opportunity, but he also learned about New York and the Rangers, the passion they have for their team um, and how first class everything is with the Rangers. And there's just a whole, there's a whole litany of things that I, I, I look back at that experience and like, even though it was very short, it was like six, seven months. And before they had to, they made the coaching change. And I, I said to myself, you know, we were beaten. We were beat up. We had, you know, we lost our number one goalie. We lost Burry. We lost Lindros. We lost Messier, you know, Leach, Nedved. And we're still competing. And I was so proud of the guys. And all of a sudden, you know, he, like he had, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to make a coaching change. I'm like, Glenn, everybody's going to come back here really fresh. And he goes, honestly, Brian, I'm going to go behind the bench. I'm like, well, you, you know, you, you built this team. You should be behind the bench. Good luck. And even he struggled with the team. So that was a little bit of vindication for me, mm -hmm. but Glenn gave me every opportunity. I can't thank him enough for that. He's a first class guy. He's honest. He's genuine. Um, I just always think back, like, and I asked him, I said, now, why did you pick me? I was an Islander and he goes, cause I wanted to get under those Islander skin. I want to get under <laughs> That's so Glenn, right? That's so Glenn. He goes, so although he liked my answers, he also told me it wasn't right away. He goes, I want to get under the skin of the Islanders a little bit, you know, the Rangers and Islanders. Cause he said, you know, he, like, it's so funny because, uh, you know, years later, the Islanders want to get back. Cause when, when Brian Leach became a free agent later on, they called me up and they said, can you do us a favor, call Brian Leach and see if he'd be an Islander? I said, I don't know. I think it might be. Hey, we want to get we want to get those Rangers back for taking you as a coach. We want to get Leach in here. I'm like, oh, I'm out. I'm out. I want to be part of that. <laughs> so just like but like in 84, Brian, you know, where you, you, you're trying to, you had Canada all mad at you. You, you. you had to win their forgiveness. Now I'm assuming you got Islanders fans mad at you. You got to win, win their hearts back. Uh, you know, obviously they, they came around, but did you find it at all icy after uh, becoming a hated Ranger, even though it was for less than a year? N not for long. It was, it yeah. was, it was short lived. And I think that was more media driven again, just to, and I thought, okay, you guys have a little fun with it, whatever, mm -hmm. but I, you know, you go where the work is and everybody understands that like 99. So you have the few that, you know, maybe say some derogatory, but I said to myself, you know what, I'm, uh, this is where the work is. I'm going to follow where the work is. I, I, you know, you follow your dream and opportunity. I said, I only just could have, you know, they had, they had an opportunity to hire me a couple of years before and they didn't. So now I'm going to the range, even though they're the dreaded there's Islanders that played for the Rangers and there's Rangers that played for the Islanders mm -hmm. and they, and everybody plays their hearts out and you give it your best. And uh, so I, I think I'm a little less hated by the Rangers and I'm certainly not hated by my Islanders. Uh, so yeah, water under the bridge, as far as I'm concerned. And like, I, I go to New York, either New York, like Ranger country or Islander country. And, you know, it's always been kind of the same in the Rangers, but uh, for, for me with understanding that passion, the Rangers have for their team and recognizing that and, and knowing that, you know, they're blue, blue collar, blue blooded to the, to the bone and uh, blue shirt love to the bone uh, and our Islander passion. I, I know that history and you never lose your Islander identity. Like it, just like Oris never loses Philly identity, never right. loses Pittsburgh identity. You always carry those identities with you. And uh, the fans love you for all the good and time has a way of healing everything. Um, and I think recognition, you can try to explain things all you want, but the fans know, I mean, they just kind of know. And I, I like that about hockey fans, you know, they kind of know, and uh, you know, Hey, you know, uh, and that's really funny because shortly after I got gabonged by the Rangers, Islander fans would phone me up, we love you, Brian. I was like, Oh God. Okay. You know, like they, they still <laughs> don't hate, like, I thought you guys hated me. There was some, some drug, like, and then that was just like, I get it. You know, yeah. we all get it. Yeah. Well, Brian, you, you're still hated in Philadelphia. And I, I'm sure you wear that as a, as a badge of honor. 
<laughs> well, you said that earlier and I cracked up because I said, Billy, Bill, Bill Clement, we were talking about one time, he goes, you know, Philadelphia might be the only city in NHL that is loved by one city and hated by everybody else. And that's so true about Philadelphia. I was like, Billy, that is the best, best uh, phrase anybody ever said. Yeah, because yeah. Pittsburgh, you, they're not hated by every team. You know, Montreal Canadiens aren't hated by every other team. You know, like it's just, but Philadelphia, you say Philadelphia, oh, we hate them. We hate them. <laughs> it doesn't matter in sport. It really, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's, it, even when they, they sang, uh, it, it, when they, the Eagles finally won the the the, uh, the Super Bowl, Jason Kelsey, the last song he sang, we're from Philly, no one likes us, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian, uh, Good time. you know, it big. Being hated by a team means that you did some damage to them. So uh, being hated by the Flyers fan base means they took notice. So you should be as proud of that, I think, I think, as being loved by the Islander fan base. Well, I think it was a great rivalry through the years. And we, we I think all, all the guys embraced it, both sides. We played some good softball games against the guys. All of us played some golf tournaments together. And, you know, so like water under the bridge is great. But I think get on the ice and it was just, you know, okay, we've got to win now. Sorry. <laughs> no yep. friendships. I'm like, I get it. But I think, you know, like Philadelphia, uh, you know, the flyers, especially like we have just great respect. Ed Snyder, great owner, you know, just reflected really well on his teams. He wa- he wanted to win and those players wanted to win it. Every GM and player and it comes through their coach. They, they, you feel it. So no, They've got they've got great history there. They can hold their head high, and yet I think it's a badge of honor that they're hated by everybody too, because <laughs> yeah. I think it just it just you know they they compete. They come yeah. and you know like you get the police escort into town and out of town. That's 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 not a bad thing, like the old slap shot used to say. Well, Brian Trottier, seven time Stanley Cup champion. Thank you so much for joining me today. On my dad used to play hockey. My my pleasure, Zach. Continuous success. Have fun, kid. Hey, thanks, buddy. Talk to you soon. Later. Bye-bye.